Okay, so we're going to go get, ahead and get started on our sec second presentation here with Jill Cohen um, about publishing a design book. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jill. Mic working? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you for joining me, and um, you know, thank you, ADEC, for inviting me. I love being in Atlanta, and I love the work that comes out of this area because it's just so welcoming, and I think our most successful projects come out of this region. So I'm always happy to be here. I missed coming here during the last year. So um, talking about publishing a design book, I think one of the most important things I can tell you is I realized the other day that probably 50% of the people that I work with have come to me and come back five years later because most people, there are, are a lot of illusions about what it takes and people call and say, oh, I'm ready, I have all my photography done. And um, that's kind of like not a great thing. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk a little bit about like, yesterday I got an email from somebody who said, do you remember this? And it was an email chain from 2013 and he was interested in doing a book and didn't realize what it was going to take. And he said, well, now I've had the time to put it together and I'm ready. So I think that um, I heard this morning from somebody that, you know, somebody talked to them and said, gee, um, one of my clients told me that they had a conversation with you and you said you weren't ready yet and it was discouraging. Um, the interesting thing is last week I was in Alice Beach working on a book for Corey Boat, the architects of Alice Beach, and they said, do you know, six years ago we met you at ADAC, you gave this lecture or something, and somebody came up and said, oh, you should do a book with them. And I said, well, I think it's too early. Um, I think people don't know about Alice yet. There's not enough there. And they said, oh, it's so discouraging. But you were so right because now, five years later, the place is booming and their work has changed and they're doing the Gulf Front stuff. And they're like, thank God we didn't do it then. So one thing I want to say is that timing is everything and there is the right moment. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So, so this question of, so you want to publish a design book doesn't mean this second. <laughs> so I want to tell you what it takes and if you're interested, you know, these are, I'm going to give you some information about what people are looking for. So the book publishing today, the word today is important because it's a post-COVID world right now. So three years ago I would have talked a lot about touring and I would have talked a lot about getting out there. I see, you know, um, Andrew and uh, historical concepts they're here, we, we started working on their book three or four years ago, and we talked a lot about touring. We even planned the pub date in coordination with coming out at the National Antique Show and other shows, and here we ended up with COVID, it was everything canceled. So um, if you're you know basing your success or, or your plans on promoting on one thing, the big shift today is all the publishers have said to me, thank God for social media, because all the events got canceled. So how did everybody know that their, the brands and the designers they love even had books? They only know by following them and by seeing their social media. So unfortunately, most of my clients are like, ah, oh, Instagram's such a burden. It's a burgeon, burden, but it's a necessary evil right now because people that are interested in you need to know what you're doing. And I don't think everybody has to I think some people over promote and I get sick of it and I wanna you know, unfollow them. And then Instagram's constantly playing with the algorithm, like if you don't use it a lot, they're not gonna post it a lot. But I think it's just about consistency, posting your best stuff, making sure your people know what you're doing, checking what's growing. I'm surprised how many times clients will say to me, um, you know, uh, somebody just showed me a new visual that they're doing for the past few weeks and I didn't think they noticed that, you know, 10 weeks ago they were consistently getting 500 likes and since they switched to this kind of new photography zone they're getting under 100 and it's like, wait, you haven't looked at this? Like, you know, listen to your, listen to your respondents. But anyway, we'll move on about Instagram. I just wanted to say you have to keep in mind that publishers are even more focus right now post COVID on what your platform is. How are people gonna know you have your book? So I wanna talk a little bit about bestsellers. Things that work and I have this list up. 
Um, you're going to recognize a lot of these people, McAlpin, Gil Schaefer, Ray Booth, Beth Webb, Bunny, you know, uh, Nancy Braithwaite. I intentionally put some of these on because they're Atlanta names. These are people that have established brands. Um, I know it was so interesting listening to the last two speakers and listening to their thoughts about like the word branding. Um, I do still call some people brands like Christopher Smith, Spitzmiller. He's a lamp designer. He has a brand. His book is an extension of who he is. Bobby McAlpin has a brand. Um, you know, whether you know, you would say that, that Beth or Nancy, when their books came out before they had product, were they brands? No, I think they, they were, you know, prominent designers who people, people, I always call it, this is a weird word, not so much somebody's aesthetic, but what their vibe is. Like, what's your vibe? If it, somebody's gonna describe you, oh, you should work with so-and-so. Well, what are they like? Or what's their style like? I think that, all these words that everybody's just talking about, about authenticity or brand, I think it's more about who you are and how you explain yourself to a potential client. You have a five minute elevator pitch. I think it is dangerous to talk about things like, um, I'm gonna give you a house that reflects who you are. What do you do with the client? Like, I don't know who I am. I'm hiring you because I don't really know how I put my house together. <laughs> so I do think that you want to explain your vibe to somebody, that you, everybody works better in a certain way. If you always do ultra modern, very clean design, and somebody says, I'm doing a very, I want to do a very layered traditional home, it's not really your vibe. I think it's okay to specialize in something. And I think each of these people could explain to you what they do. And one of the things I do when I'm working on a book is try to come up with the principles. So Nancy Braithwaite was easy because she's so distinct and it doesn't vary. So I could look at her brand and say, all right, here's, here's who you are. You're about scale. You're about no color. You're about light and shadow. You're about texture. And you're about editing. I don't think she has to say to somebody, I'm going to give you a house that you feel good in. I think she says, this is what I specialize in. If this appeals to you, I can give you the house you want. So I think, you know, figuring out who you are, why don't you focus on distilling, like, signature things that show up. It doesn't mean signature product, like I always use a gravit, whatever, not that. But I like pattern, I don't like pattern. I like symmetry, I don't like symmetry. I like, you know, being fearless, whimsical, um, serious, elegant, whatever. But you, you have to find some words so people understand what you do. And, um, and then there are people that are kind of get away with, with being successful in their books because they have a big name like Whoopi Goldberg or Aaron Lauder. You know, it's like, okay, this Whoopi book is going to be fun and crazy and out there. And, um, and those two people really didn't have to promote, although they did. And Whoopi did all these good things on late night TV. Um, so, some things that sell books um, are natural, and then there are things that, um, that sell books because the people did various things. So for example, The Perfect Kitchen, it's a waterworks book. They have a platform. They have an established brand identity. They have stores. Um, if I'm going into a publishing company and saying waterworks wants to do a book, I don't really have to explain who they are. So, um, and then some of the people, Kassler, Gianetti, Grade, Melanie Turner, these are people that their, their books don't look alike. They all have something that's signature different, whether it's a contemporary style, um, whether it's um, you know, a regionality, whether it's uh, a love of color. And, and I think you know, what I'm kind of getting to here is that I do think it's important to think about who you are and you know, it's funny where somebody, we get to a point where it's like, what should we have on the cover of the book? And I always say, we need two things. One is we need something that really represents your work and the best of your work. And also what you're going to see in the rest of the book. So you're putting out a vibe, you're putting out something that, that is going to sit on the top of people's coffee table. And you want, it to, you, you want it to attract other people and say, oh my God, who did this? 
What do they do? I want to see the rest of it. So I often get people that say, you know what, I just want my name on the cover, or I just want you know, a logo or a graphic. And um, that, that, that doesn't actually sell a lot of books unless you're, you know, John Saladino or something, and you just people want to see, or Axel Revort. So authors are the number one salespeople for their books. Any assumption that the old days of publishing, where there were like 300 reps going into independent stores, that's all gone. The 70 percent of the books are sold through Amazon, some Barnes and Noble, and a small group of independents. And you know as well as I do, you go into a small independent bookstore, you're not going to find a big arrangement of these books. The independent booksellers feel that showing coffee table books, all they're doing is having people come in and flip through and then going to Amazon and buying them at half price. So when I go into an independent bookstore and I say, "You don't have enough of our, you know, of our design books," they say, well, I don't want to be an Amazon showroom. And the books get flipped through, and they get messed up. And, um, and so how do you miss out on all these shops that are in small towns and have your book really be well distributed? You have to kind of do it yourself. And I have clients that make sure that everywhere they go, they're going to you know, Texas to a design week, or they're going to you know, Charlotte, or they're going somewhere. Go to your local bookstore. Bring a copy of your book. Sign it. Say, I'm going to give this to you. I'd love for you to order more. If it sells on the shelf, please reorder from my publisher. And you kind of have to go out there, because there's 1.7 million books a year published now. And that includes like a million that people self-publish. And those people are filling up their cars and going around and getting it. So if you think the publisher is hand-selling to every little bookstore, it's just not happening. So um, so this is like um, the last speaker, he said, um, he tells his clients, what do you want to invest in your book? Well, how much time do you want to invest in selling your book? Because you're going to need to do that. And obviously, this is pre-COVID, big lectures, full houses, group signings, um, you know, uh, great sponsors. You'll see on the bottom left, that was an LCDQ party at Meacock's, and the bottom right was a visual comfort event, and all these sponsors would have group book signings and people, and I hope those days come back, because it really did move a lot, but it's been a weird time. So what makes you desirable to a publisher? Well, when I showed you the best sellers, you know that it's easy for me to call somebody and say, Waterworks wants to do a book, Whoopi Goldberg wants to do a book, the first thing they say is, great, how can we make this happen? What does she want to do? You know, is it something marketable? That kind of thing. So everybody else that doesn't have an immediately recognizable name, the question is, what can I do to excite somebody? So one is, somebody mentioned here, there's a difference between influencers and designers. So I have sold books for influencers. But if I go out to a publisher and say, so-and-so has 500,000 um, followers. Publishers will say, oh my god, that's great, because that'll probably sell 5,000 books right off the bat. But what are they doing? Are they showing fashion or something that's in and out today? Are they showing other people's work that they don't have the rights to? Like, that's not going to happen. But if it's somebody like, let's say, Mark Sykes, or a designer, and he's showing mostly his work, and people really get it, that, that's exciting to a publisher. So the publisher's like, OK, he must be doing something that's gathering all these people. Um, so social media is a big driver. Um, the other thing is the value of the work. Now, I do have people that have three or 400,000 followers that are influencers that aren't designers. And I'll give you an example of somebody who's been a success. Uh, Courtney Milton, she's French Country Cottage. She has 375,000 followers. She came to me years ago, I want to do a book. Well, what is her content? Mostly flowers, mostly the same flowers. She says if she doesn't post you know, 100 pink roses, she doesn't get the likes. But she still has 20 to 30,000 people liking her stuff every day. Is it worthy of a book? So she wanted to do a book. So I started working with her on how to develop content when you're not a designer and you're an influencer. Um, so one of the things that applies to you all is, is there something that people always gravitate to you that 
um, might be something everybody loves. You can milk that. <laughs> you know, if you look at, I look at, we work with Coleman and Kravis for years, and when we post a picture that has very, very um, exquisite classical architecture, those posts get between 800 and 1,200 likes. When we're posting a vignette of a piece of furniture or the girls in the office, it's 200. So it's like, OK, you know, we're, we're going to make sure we're not killing people with this, but that we are going to focus. And even when we do photo shoots, let's get more of this hallway. Let's get more of these things integrated with the classical architecture, because that's what people are responding to. So you need to keep tracking what is the sweet spot. Um, and professional photography, I'm going to go into that next, and you're going to see what I consider professional photography. And a lot of, a lot of times, people are using a professional photographer without a stylist. And that can be a critical error. And I'm going to show you lots of examples of that. Um, so if I'm going in to Rizzoli or Monticelli or whatever, and I'm showing layouts of 50 pages, and it's you know historical concepts or McAlpin or Ray or whatever, people that are investing in their photography and styling. And the publisher is saying, this is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. If an hour later I'm in with layouts, and it's weaker photography, and I'm saying, well, this client is willing to invest more and get a stylist and what next, it's like, eh, it's kind of like making a promise. And, and you are being compared. I think in Instagram and, and the last speaker said a lot, like, don't compare yourself to other people. But if you want a book, you have to know that every publisher is doing maybe 30 books a year. And they're getting pitches for 500. You have to stand out either some way, that you're doing something more creative, or you're doing something very, you know, um, on trend. I mean, you know, let's say when, uh, you know, Bohemian style was hot and you were the one doing it. Your moment is there. It was less about the photography than it was about the creativity. Um, or, you know, I, so I think, I think it's really important to be aware that they're looking at other people. It's just like the magazines. Well, it's not just like the magazines, but <laughs> like the old magazines where they're getting pitched 50 projects, they have room for one more. And how's your photography? How's your styling? How's the curation of the room? Is it going to teach something, too? So it, it is a comparison. You're trying out. Um, brand extension licensing. I mean, I, I'll use Suzanne Kassler and Mark Sykes as a great example. But Kassler, by having so many product lines um, with Visual Comfort and Lee Jofa and Hickory, um, her visibility is so high and Ballard that the publisher has the security blanket knowing that a lot of people know who she is not just from the books. So, um, and retail relationships. Sometimes a store or company, like a Waterworks or somebody behind you, um, can be also a big boost. Um, experience with touring and speaking, that's not going to make them sign you if the work isn't good, but it's, it's a nice bonus to have. So let's talk about how you distinguish yourself. You know, here are examples of four totally different types of books and people that are happy to embrace who they are. You know, so, um, you know, somebody like Mark Sykes, OK. He, you know, put a stake in the ground. Here's who I'm going to be. Blue is beautiful. I'm going to own this. I'm going to make sure that everybody knows what I like. And if you like it too, then I'm your guy. And he does show, you know, fashion, books, signature. But it's all in the same vibe. So the good thing about being um, distinct is that you see the threads in the work. It's about natural wovens. It's about sisal. It's about you know, very specific color, natural, blue, you know, you know, denim, whatever it is. And I have a client who worked with a very high-end um, AD100 designer in New York, and then said, oh, listen, we just got this beach house. I think we're just going to hire Mark Sykes for that, because you know he, he's more appropriate for that area. So it surprised me, because most of, most of my clients have repeat 
um, clients. Some, you're doing somebody's house. They want you to do their beach house. They want you to do their apartment because you've already. But sometimes somebody's work is so distinct. You're like, I could see that in the beach house, and I'm going for that. So um, I did a book with WRJ out in Jackson Hole, and they are hired constantly out there because, and, and when I first met with them, and they were like, I want to do a book, and we've done, you know, in New York Tribeca part and whatever, I said, where do you want to work? Do you want, we, well, we moved to Jackson Hole. We want to be here. I'm like, okay, why don't you be the guys in Jackson Hole? Like, stop fighting your regionality. Be the guys in Jackson Hole. Why are we going to try to promote a New York apartment? You don't really even, you know. So this is what's interesting. They became the guys in Jackson Hole. We shot the book. I'll show you what we did to really, you know, immerse them in that spot. And a month ago, Rush was in New York and said, come down, I have to show you this unbelievable project. They did this monstrosity apartment in Tribeca because one of the Jackson Hole clients that fell in love with them that they just did had a place out there. So it's like, you know, a lot, of, a lot of designers have said to me over the years, I think I should open an office in New York. And I say, why? Well, I want more work in New York. I'm just going to get like an office and go there once a month because then people will hire me. That's not, that's not really how it works. That person actually did it for a year. It was a waste of money. And she built her business in Maryland, where she is, big enough that she has clients now that do have apartments in New York. It has to be, you can't just place a, a, you know, a PO box somewhere and think, now people are going to call me. Um, but anyway, talking about being distinct with your style, I've been working with the Giannettis for you know, 13 or 14 years. We did their first book. This is another thing. There, I have a lot of clients doing multiple books. So I'm on book four with Kassler. We just did four with Giannetti. We have another one coming with Bobby, whatever. But what's interesting is where do you start? So having been at Random House for many years and working with big brands like you know Martha Stewart, Susie Orman, you know, Chris Madden, those people, you want to start with the big picture. Martha Stewart started with an entertaining book. That was the umbrella. Then after that, she could do hors d'oeuvres, flowers, weddings, you know, offshoots. But a lot of people want to start with like a singular, I'm going to do this one house. I can't sell a book on one house unless you're Furlow Gatewood, you know, <laughs> or John Saladino. What they want is the umbrella of what's the range. So where the Giannettis, we started with patina style. What's your style? Why don't we explain through showing different houses? You know, Brooke has the velvet and linen, and Steve has more industrial. Let's establish what your style is. If people like it, we go on. And then from there, we did Patina Farm and Patina Living and the recent Patina Homes. And the evolution over the years, a lot of it came from the sharing. You know, it's like, here's how we live. You know, here's, here's, here are animals. You know, here's how we like this indoor-outdoor lifestyle. Well, they also, over the years, evolved over 15 years. When we started, they were X age, and now they're 15 years older. Now they like being in Ojai. They don't really want to travel all over the place. So um, they're OK with us doing a book where it's mostly California homes. So I think you want to think about you know, being a regional star is really a great thing. And one of the things I want to mention is many years ago, I met, I, I was at Random House or Time Inc. And an agent came to me and said, I'm working with this girl in Saratoga Springs. Her name is Rachel Ray. She's a local. And she has a little TV show called you know, um, Eating on $25 a Day. And she carries a handheld camera. And she'll go into somebody's trailer or house. And she cooks up a meal in half an hour for $25 a day. It's so popular. And I did a little local book for her, and it sold 5,000 copies. And like, we're in a town with you know, 50,000 people. That's a big percentage. So I was actually working with QVC for a few years, and I brought her to QVC because I thought her television you know, charisma was there. And I brought her to the president of QVC, and he looked at her, and he said, look, I looked at your reel, and we'd love to have you, and, and you know, we'd put you on a show. And she said, oh, good, I want to do a cooking show. He said, no, we don't do that. You know, you're going to sell everything. You're going to sell a mattress. You're going to sell jewelry. You know? and, you know, and she said, oh, no, no, I only want to do cooking. So, um, you know, so she said no. And then they said, well, we do production. Why don't we produce a little show, and you can show it to the Food Network, and then we'll get a production fee, stupid of them, to offer that. They should have said a production fee and a percentage. But they said, we'll do a production fee. and..." 
take the reel to the Food Network, and then she got her show. Now, what's interesting about that is she was a star in one little town, and we know where she is now. So I think if you're starting out and you feel like, oh my God, I just don't want to be just Atlanta. I have to spread my wings and do something in New York. After that. I, I think, I think becoming, remember, think of all the regional stars. Ina Garden had, you know, Barefoot Contest in the Hamptons. She got a column in Martha's Magazine because Martha loved her. She was in the Hamptons, like, okay, she's a, she's a major star. Um, and regionality is good because if you're talented, people start to understand. Like, I think about Bobby McAlpin, okay? He was, when I first met him, you know, he was the, the king of the South, okay? His talent was so, so great that I recently met a client out in California who said, you know, I, I always loved his work, but we live in LA. And then I saw this house he did. It happened to be the Rella Gleason house that had the double islands. She's like, he, it was so great, I thought, what would a McAlpin house look like out here? And she hired him, and it's amazing. So it's like, if you're great, and people love your work, you'll figure out how to translate it where they live. And so the Giannettis, they do a lot of these types of houses in Nashville and other places, but, uh, you know, I think it's great to be like the biggest one in California and rather than diluted everywhere. Um, let's talk about photography. It's your biggest expense, it's your biggest investment, and it's the most important part of your brand because I always say 99% of the population will never be in this room. 99.999. <laughs> the only way you can show them this room is to show them the skill of the work you've done. And without professional lighting, you do not see the nuance on the fabric on this curtain. You do not see the hand-painted de Gournay walls. You don't see that there's a leather crackle in the chairs here. Um, you, you, you lose all the nuance. And um, it, it is, you know, it's like I'm constantly preaching to spend the money on great photography and styling because these pictures, everyone should be a hero. These pictures have to stand the test of time. I put this one up here because this is from Gil's first book, so it's probably eight years old. It's still a wow shot. It's timeless. This is still a wow shot. This is probably a 10-year-old project. Um, and it's kind of distinctly who he is. And why is photographing for a book so different than photographing for your website? So this happens all the time. I'm saying it's important to find someone who matches your style. How many times do people call me and they go, oh my God, I love the work of, I love the work of uh, Thomas Loop, or I love the photography of um, Bill Abramowitz. And it's like, okay, well you love Bill, he's all about dark and moody and shadowy. Your work is contemporary, white, and light. He's not really your guy. <laughs> also, there is a regional skill to the photographers. So Lisa Romero lives out in California. She has shot all the Gianetti stuff. I've known over the last 10 or 12 years, everybody who shoots Gianetti material, if I get a call from a magazine, they say, I want to run the house, I'll send them pictures of Bettina Farm from three different photographers, and they always choose Lisa. Her, her gift of light, her knowledge of how to capture that moody light in California, she lives there. I'm going to go back to this shot and show you that like these shots are ethereal the way she can marry the exterior and the interior like it's one space. Everybody wants to use this kind of picture. It evokes emotion. I would never use Lisa for a New York contemporary environment. It's just the photographers, where they live and where they work, they understand the light differently. So I brought Lisa to Alice Beach last week because she could make that very ethereal and a contemporary photographer working in New York that does a lot of light-filled white places would have blown out Alice Beach. I wouldn't have gotten the diversity. So you have to know what the photographer specializes in um, to choose the right person. You know, like Gil works with Eric Piasecki or Simon Upton, who does country houses very well, does architecture books, so he knows how to capture, um, you know, Andrew, uh, historical concepts work with, with Eric. He does Coleman and Kravis. 
he, he, he's better at architecture and, and because he has a way to marry his photos where he can capture the ceiling and the floor and merge them meticulously with all these light. But you're paying for the skill. You're paying for the skill. You're paying for the plates, the skill, the technician he has working for him. And the pictures say it all. And I think that that investment shows, oh, wow, the level of photography and the quality of work. I know what I'm going to be paying for these guys. And, and that's what you want to put out there. You don't want to put out there a junior photographer with no styling and somebody go, oh, good, I can, this person probably charges 50000 for a house. Because if you're using cheap photography, people are going to feel that. So you also want somebody to tell your story. The thing that shocks me the most is how many people, super high-end professional architects and designers, come to me and they say, oh, here, what do you think of my pictures? And I'm like, OK, well, what, what were you shooting here? It was like, they sent the photographer and didn't come. Well, the photographer knew what to shoot. And, and, and now I'm on shoots every week, and I have to tell you how many AD100 designers I work with that literally say to the photographer, OK, do your thing in that room. I'm like, what do you mean do your thing? What happens is the photographer goes in, they're like, oh, this is a beautiful vignette. I'm going to focus on this urn. An hour later, the designer goes, oh, the urn belonged to the, to the homeowner. I hate that piece. Well, you just spent an hour having. And I used to get people that sent me the pictures and would say, don't use those, because I'm like, well, where were you? Well, I sent a stylist and a, and a photographer. They know better than me. But they don't know the story of the house. So I always feel the most important thing is for you to take that photographer and stylist. First of all, you have Zoom calls in advance so everybody knows what we're doing. Do we have enough time? Did we book a one-day shoot when it needs two days? If that, if so, then are we leaving the landscape out? Well, you can't expect them to do everything. Are they going to run around? But the first thing that should happen before they unload and unpack and set up is for you to do a tour of the house and say, here's what's important to me. This was a white box. I brought in this antique mantle. It made the room. OK, how are we going to shoot this hero shot around that mantle? Because that's your story. And I always say every picture that's taken, you should think about, if you're doing a book or a magazine, what would your caption be? And if it's the mantle that you brought in that's great, and it's hidden off to the side, you're not going to write a caption and say, the mantle was the starting point. You don't even see it in the picture. So you have to control the photographer, and you're paying for it. And I find that all the designers and architects that I work with, they're so polite. And you're in a service business. You've learned how to speak nicely to your clients. So you're hiring a photographer, and you don't want to, they come over and they're like, I don't want to tell them, but that's not an angle I want. OK? So you're spending a fortune on every picture, and you don't want to insult somebody that you've hired. There's a nice way to do it. There's a nice way to say, that's not focusing on something I did or care about or will write about. And even though it's a little trickier, to get this wall, this is something I handcrafted, or I had 20 coats of lacquer. This needs to be shot. You're the pro. You can figure out how to, how, to, how to put it in its best light, but that's very important to me. And so you must direct the photographer, because the difference between a book and a magazine, a magazine is only going to use, at the most, eight of your pictures, OK? Big hero, you know, kitchen, living space, primary bedroom, hallway, a couple of bucolic things. The books, we want a 20-page deep dive into the nuance, into the rugs, into the, so if you're hiring a photographer and you're getting you know, 15 pictures of a day, that's going to be a short chapter. It's going to be eight spreads. And you have to have like 250 pages. You've got to shoot 25 houses to fill it. So you have to milk it. So that's why don't. Trust the photographer to know. The best photographer is like, when, when we work with Eric or Simon or any of these guys, if they go into a place and they don't have direction, they're going to say, this is going to get pitched to a magazine. I need 12 heroes. That's it. I don't really have to do the details. Details are very important. When you're shooting a detail, don't let them pick the detail. They're going to pick the nuance of a flower. What does it really say about your work? If you had you know, a handmade ceramic that went with the mantle, and that's on the, well, focus on that, because that's something you can, you can show. So I'm going to give you examples now. 
here's the guys that I took on in Jackson Hole. They came to me because they were getting a lot of business, but it was all local, and they were only getting in Mountain Living magazine. And they said, we really want to up the ante and get more national attention. But they were hiring a great photographer in Jackson Hole that shot the Tetons. She was an environmental photographer. Her pictures of mountains and horses were great. You would never saw the furniture in her pictures. You saw a big window of the Tetons and the side of the furniture. I'm like, it's not interior design photography. So what we did was we switched things around, and we um, brought in a photographer who was going to be able to shoot the environment. But here's what I'm talking about, about detail. On the right, you see this room. That's what most photographers are going to shoot that room, maybe shoot a pillow. But here we're talking about texture. And what I wanted to do here was instruct the photographer to go into detail in this chapter. So I want a different perspective. I'm going to look down on this table now. Now we can talk about the rug. In here, we can't even see the rug, right? Look in a different way. Don't let your photographer shoot five pictures of like, here it is with and without flowers. Change the perspective. This narrative on the right is texture for pillows, beautiful rug, mixing wood, metal, curated, you know, coffee table. On the left, you see this beautiful Teton picture. So together in a book, they tell a story. Now we move on, and we're seeing the kitchen. Here's my hero. But I really want to bring these people into the detail here. So in a book, we shoot this. How can you show people your attention to detail? Now, when you look at this picture of the marble uh, in the middle on the bottom, you never, a photographer is never going to shoot that voluntarily. It's not going in a magazine. might even, not even go on your website. But in a grid like this, this is how your reader in your book understands your attention to detail and your curation and your, the quality of the work. Going back to this kitchen, maybe the caption here says, you know, we kept these rustic beams or we brought them in and this beautiful marble table. Now you're bringing them right into the close-up, how the beam looks with these beautiful, you know, you can see the marble in the background. And now we're going to take an even deeper dive. And the, the biggest thing in book photography is scale. I want different scale. So on the right, I see the dining room. But how do I show the reader that this table isn't just a slab? I'm going way in. And when you say to a photographer, I want a close-up, no one ever shoots this close. I take my iPhone, I get what I want, and I go, I want it that close. I want to see this, I want to see this table, and I want to see this beautiful object on it. And this work of art is so different. You will not see these types of pictures. No magazine has the, the pages to show these details. So for your website or your book, you give people a deep dive. This gives me my 20-page chapter, not eight, you know, five spreads. Now, the other thing about putting books together, here's something I recently did. This book came out a few weeks ago. So Ashley Whitaker, some people can't explain what they do. And I kind of have to go there. So I think Suzanne Kassler is like that and Ashley Whitaker. There are a lot of people that are very instinct. It's, it's instinct. They're like, you know, oh, I like color. I like patterns. Sometimes I don't like color. I like, you know, it's like they're saying all these generalities. And um, sometimes I'm like, let me just go look at your work. So when I first went to Kassler to look at her work, I was like, oh, it's very pretty. Dressmaker details. You know, you're, uh, you know, all of the nuance. Um, people don't know how to express that. So Ashley tried to explain to me what her houses were like, and then I went and toured this house. And she said, you know, I'm really aware of, like, how it all works together, the whole thing. And I like this kind of link and connection to everything. So I looked at this house, and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're, we're going to shoot it with Thomas Loop, a great photographer. We're going to style it. You're going to do everything you plan to do. 
but I'm going to do a lesson inside of this that's going to be a little separate part of the chapter. And it's going to do all these close-up photos to, to give a lesson. And even in marketing, you could take this chapter out and market it separately. So look at what we did. Part of her gig is connection. So I made the photographer take this picture on the left of this table because you see the curtains and you see them on the right looking into the other room that has walls that connect to the... Now, normally the photographer would take the picture and cut the curtain off in both cases. But I was trying to make a point of how the walls in the room beyond connected to the fabric. And then you keep going, and I'm calling it out in the book with a connecting the interior vista to the next. And in this entryway, you see the fabric on the, on the, um, the light fixture above, the fabric on the wall, and on the pillows. And as you go into the room, they reappear. So the chairs have fabrics on the pillows from the other room, obviously the curtains, how this all connects. But then I'm taking an even deeper dive in the book. And I'm doing a really close up, OK, this is a lesson. The reason this is really important is that none of these pictures would have been taken by the photographer if we hadn't outlined. And this was five minutes. This was me saying to Thomas, you know what? Here's where we're going to do a lesson. Follow me for a second. Shoot this, 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 this. Let's get the curtain, the, the whatever. And, and don't let a photographer say, oh, you need four pictures for a grid? I'm going to take four. Because one of them's always a bomb or duplicative. And I'm like, can I have six? Because two of them aren't going to work. And doing grids like this are very difficult because if everything's facing the wrong way, it, they look funny. So you, so, and then I have a lot of professional photographers that I love, and they're like, you know what, I can't do this now. I'm going to come back at the end of the day and do some details for you. Doesn't happen. We run out of time. The lights dim. It doesn't work. If you're doing this kind of a telling a story, you have a house that's your best house ever. You want to shoot the heck out of it. You got to add a day, and you have to make them stay in that room, take the thing off the tether, and go and do these details. Because they don't happen later. And um, should you hire a stylist? When you look at this, without a stylist, there's no oversized plant there. And um, things aren't as pristine. And the reason the stylist is so important is that no interior, stylists are not interior designers. Some of them try to be, but they don't have your skill. A stylist is somebody who sees things in a three-dimensional way and does an editorial piece that you wouldn't live that way. What, you wouldn't walk into any of these rooms and have, number one, leafy things in a bedroom that somebody is going to breathe in the pollen. You'd never do it. But you have to, it's editorial. It's like going into Vogue and seeing the pink dress that only Zendaya would wear, OK? But it's making a statement. So you're making a statement because without this, it's, it's bland. So I want to show you how important the stylist is. So here's a shoot we did for Ellie Coleman. And Ellie did a beautiful room. But this is an apartment on the right that has like many New York apartments, the living room and dining room together. Well, when you shoot them together, it's very confusing. But these branches allowed us to divide the room for the photo. And on the left, Ellie did a flower arrangement of roses. The scale was too small. Then she went and got something else. The scale was still too small. Because the way you would live, you wouldn't do anything this big. So the stylist came in and said, I'm sorry, I got to go back to the flower district and get you, you know, eight foot branches. And he's like, they're too big. But of course, that's the picture that's run everywhere. And it's also being creative. Like, OK, in Ellie's case, she's more traditional. She wanted a set table. But so that we didn't make it too old fashioned-y, you have to, a stylist can say, listen, if we do roses here, it's going to look too old fashion you need more architectural flowers. 
And you know, Ellie's somebody who's like, oh, I don't know, it's not us. I'm like, let's do it for the picture, okay? <laughs> and so, so there are things we do for the pictures, okay? So this is a traditional one. Now, we, we were shooting this bedroom, and I said, I have an idea. I need to frame something for a cover. On the left, let's just take a picture like that, that leaves space for a title, because I'm going to pitch this, and this is a perfect cover. And then it happened. You have to plan for these things. You can't send somebody a bunch of pictures. They're like, well, you know what? It's, we have a potential cover coming on a major magazine. They're asking to come back to this dining room because my client did a two-day shoot where they should have done a three. They did the dining room as one horizontal and like a pretty detail. The dining room's perfect for, for a cover. And we're getting the cover, but we have to send the photographer back to do a vertical shot. If it's a hero and you want to get a magazine in there, again, you say to the photographer, I need it in a horizontal and vertical. Well, then we're not going to have time for that. We'll come back to that later. Or you're going to, OK. So this is why doing a one-day shoot is a rush through. And you're going to lose your details and, and your opportunity to do horizontals and verticals. So sometimes that's, you don't even know. That's why you're losing it. So here's a picture of the old WRJ. On the left was the other photographer who sh shoots the Tetons. She was always aiming outside. But you really couldn't see any of the furniture. So on the right is my stylist and photographer that I brought into them, where, interestingly enough, by the door on the left, there are two objects. Some of the same objects are in there, but you see them in a different way. So on the right, the lighting is so good. You see the console. The flowers are pretty. And um, you see a piece of art stacked on there, so there's a little bit more interest. The left, it just looks like an empty room. And, and, and they had a stylist there. They thought it was styled, but it wasn't styled right. And the lighting is a night and day. Um, here's another one. Uh, they shot this house. Uh, it was published probably locally. We reshot it for the book. On the left, you're seeing too much, and you're staring at two white towels. It's a bore. On the right, same room. Look at that towel. Look at the tray of perfume. We didn't bring anything in. We found the stuff that was, existed in the house. Perspective was 100% different. This is, a diff this is the same room. This is the work of a stylist and a better photographer. This, to me, is night and day. And this bathroom is run in several magazines. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, Ellie Coleman, huge project that ran in El Decor last year. Um, on the left is a professional scouting shot by a photographer who, you know, was OK. No styling. This is a night and day transformation. This is Eric, again, master of light, technical skills. But look at the styling. The flowers, we, the stylist doesn't just make flowers. They move things. We moved, changed the perspective, OK? We moved that table, and the, the sculpture became more of a focus. And we moved a table next to the chair to give some interest up front so you're not just looking at the side of a chair. And then putting in a quirky, colorful piece in the, in the fireplace. So that's a night and day shot. This one, again, same room. Same room. Yes, we decided when you have a room like this that is like gold and it's blingy already, you might as well go to town <laughs> and like add to it. This was such a shock for us because El Decor, you know, um, obviously loves much more kind of bohemian, funky places. And they were like, OK, this is the best of this type of thing. But, and guess what? The stylist here, he cost a lot of money. His day rate wasn't bad, but he bought a fortune of flowers because he needed to have a variety of things. And, you know, how much we got 10 pages in El Decor. What's the value of that, right? I mean, there's no question about it. Working with a writer, I 
I have these books up here because they all had a different situation where Madeline Stewart wanted to write her own book. Maybe one of the first times that's happened where she wrote the whole thing without any help. Um, it's a personal story. She's like a Hollywood person. She's a lot funny. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it helped. I'm not going to reveal any sales figures here. Um, but, but I don't know if it helped. Now, Bobby McAlpin, who's a poet, and everybody knows how, what a genius he is, he still has a writing partner. He still works with Susan Sully because bouncing off ideas, somebody can take it to the next level. Jeff Dungan was somebody who said, I want to write my own book. I, I, I have a lot to say. And, and he is poetic. And he does have a distinct voice, so I encouraged it. But not because he's not a professional writer, when I read it, it was full of redundancy, like he said it before, he said it before. So that can ruin a manuscript. So halfway through, I said, you need a partner. And that kind of is hard. You don't want to bring somebody in the middle. You've already written it. It's like a rewrite, whatever. Um, Bunny Williams, she's somebody who like writes her own thing in yellow lined paper and then gives it to somebody else and says, could you write this now? And it, it's all different. Um, so, um, so anyway, it's, it's a very personal decision. Um, now, I'm going to go through the phases of book development and what it takes. And this is really not for everybody. This is like people that are working with me. This is what I have to do. I have to first look at your stuff. I have to say, like, why are you doing a book? Some people are doing a book for, for all the wrong reasons and could be doing a beautiful brochure that gets distributed to their clientele that has the best of the best, skim the cream, more is not better. When I look at somebody's website and they've got 25 houses up there and every picture, including a lot of old stuff, like get it down. And people get hung up. Everyone I've worked with has said to me, oh, but that project brought me a lot of work. Yeah, but maybe five years ago. And maybe it's still better to show out of 10 pictures, just show four. Because the ones that have some dated computer equipment or something, don't do, don't do, it, it's not a good thing. So really tighten up. Less is more. Um, you know, when you're fortunate enough to do a lot of work, and historical concepts and McAlpin are examples of people who can be very selective and say, we're not shooting everything. We're going to shoot the best of the best, or we're going to shoot the range. Also, invest in your photography in things you want more of. So if you did a tiny little project with a very low budget, you're like, it's really sweet. Everybody responds to it. I'm going to spend the money shooting it. Well. I have a Gil Schaefer story from many years ago in his first book where he didn't want everybody to think he just did big, giant projects. So he put in like a cute charmer. And he said to me later, boy, was that a mistake. I get so many calls for like the little project that now I don't have time for. So when you're investing and you're going to shoot, you've got to decide, you know what, this is the best project. I have to shoot this like crazy. I'm going to regret not adding a day. And that money is amortized over your website, a book, a magazine publication, a brochure, um, a portfolio you want to print out and send to clients or prospects. Somebody calls your office and they say, you know, I'd like to work with you. Um, can we, I'd like to know how you work and your budget, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The best thing to do is say, OK, let's set up a call. And next week, we'll Zoom or the week after. From the time you set up that call, you should have something in their hands. And it should just be the best of the best. Maybe it's one project. Maybe it's one beautiful shoot you spent your money on with a great photographer and a stylist. And you say, just thought I'd get into your hands one of my recent projects. And print it out on beautiful paper. Spend the money. Don't go to you know Staples. Go and have it done and say, you know what, this might just put it over the edge. Also, if you're putting it up on your website and it's already out, you may want to add details or things you didn't put in the website that, that they don't see. That's why I'm saying be careful with the details that are being shot. Have something to say about them. Don't shoot the flower arrangement. Everybody has really different taste on that. 
Um, and if it looks good in the photos, somebody might think, that's too much. I wouldn't have a, you know, something like that in my house. So I think you want to shoot your work. So the first thing I do is I look at your photo archive. What do you already have? Are you using the right photographer? Are you giving the best message, et cetera? I also look at your branding. And like, what have the magazines been saying about you? Oh, they always say, I remember Jay Jeffers when I took him on. I'm like, oh my god, you're the king of color. He's like, not anymore. He said, all the, I said, but all the magazines say you do color. He goes, well, that's when I had clients that had no money. You know, I was painting every wall red and green. And he goes, I don't want to be known for that anymore. So I said, oh, well, what about vintage furniture? Oh, no, now they're buying the real stuff. <laughs> so it's like a lot of what's been written about you in the magazines are what your current clients are reading, and it might be your past. So I think some of what's important is you can update your website with your language, doing more, doing more uh, you know, finely edited, sophisticated interiors. Like, put your language out there and don't kind of rest on the past if you want to evolve. So first I look at the brand. Are you expressing yourself the way you want to? Is this who you are now? Is this the work you want in two years? The next thing is, how do we show a publisher? Um, you've got to give me your best photos, and maybe we're going to shoot something brand new, because I have to say to the publisher, here's what they've done, here's what you've seen, but here's what's coming. It's even bigger and better, and you've never seen this. And then we do these sales materials that are the layouts, the package, and what's going to sell you? Oh, here's how the author's going to tour. Here's how we're going to market. Uh, you know, sometimes I develop a comparative review where I'll take, um, let's say, Andrew, and he's won these awards, he's uh, done this type of work, he's in this region, he's working in all these places. OK, so it's OK for me to say, listen, here, here's, his, here's his stats. <laughs> They're the same as Gil Schaefer. He, he's, he's on, and now Gil has a big quantity of sales. So then the publisher's like, oh, I see. He's the next guy. We, we have to publish him, too. So it's OK to compare yourself when you're selling yourself. And you're saying, I'm doing work on par with this person. I've been published in the same magazines this person has. And publishers, they don't want to take risks. They want to know that they want to know exactly what they're buying. As an agent, it used to be that I'd travel around and see all the publishers and show these layouts physically. But now, because of COVID, we are in a Zoom world. And it's almost better, because you get a group of people on the screen, and they have to pay attention to you for the entire time. <laughs> and then we have an electronic version that goes to them. What does an offer look like? OK, the first thing I have to tell you is if you think the publisher is paying for your pictures, they're not at all. So I keep going back to what are you investing? They're, they're licensing your content. You have to own your content. I don't mean own. Your photographers are going to retain the copyright. But when you're shooting anything, make sure you're getting book rights. They're not the same as promotional rights. Because you earn money off of your book, and the photographer wants additional usage fee. It's much cheaper to set it up up front. Although there are some young photographers that are saying, here, I'll shoot for you for $3,000, and you can use it in magazines, web, promotion. If you want to use it for a book, I'm going to charge you an additional fee. Negotiate it then. You don't want to call them and go, I got a book deal. Oh, I want 300 a picture for everything I did for you. How about negotiating up front like 50? Or for each shoot that you did, I'll pay you another $150 to use those in my book. And then it's established up front. Don't save it for later. And make sure it's all in writing. I can't tell you how many uber professional AD100 clients I have. Oh, yeah, I have a deal with him. He's shooting everything. Well, there's no paperwork. And then they have an agent now, and the agent says, well, there's nothing in writing. He told me a different story. It always happens. And <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I can't emphasize enough. It's not just enough to have an email. It's just not. You have an email that says, yeah, you'll own these, or I'll charge you whatever. You want to respond to that with a document that says, thank you so much, as we confirmed. You're charging me this. I can use it on web, social, whatever, in an unlimited way. And if I do a book, it'll be an additional X then. Or I'll pay you $1,000 a day more, 
and I have all usage. And could you sign the bottom of that? Because my, you know, CFO, whatever, somebody, my office manager has to keep it in the file. And you can always blame the publisher. You can say, I understand a publisher's contract has me sign off that we have this in writing, and I need it on a separate document and email. They won't accept an email. So, you know, you can always, it's, it's where we get into trouble is, you know, oh, trust me, I, you know, I'll, I'll do this for you. I'm in, I'm in the business with a lot of legal details, and I'm really adamant about having everything in writing and signed, including homeowner permission and all of that. Um, so the publisher is going to ask me, you know, how big is your platform? If you have 500,000 followers, they're already assuming that you're going to sell more books, and they're going to give you a little bit more of an advance. And um, they will determine the size of the book based on a number of issues. So if your work is really substantial and heavy and really comprehensive and you're an award-winning status, the book is going to be bigger. So a lot of the architecture books, you know, historical concepts or, or um, you know, uh, Coleman and Kravis, this is really, it, it, the books aren't going to really work in a tiny style. But then there are some people who are aware, like Mark Sykes was aware that he was an emerging young whatever, and he's like, I want to get a lot more copies out. I want my book to be like $30 so everybody would buy it. So that was an intentional decision. And the publishers more and more are doing smaller books for first timers, even if they're well established. They're like, we don't know their track record. So I get a lot of people that say, I want a 10 by 12, but it's kind of not your decision. Um, then um, basically publishers meet, they look at they look at all of these elements, the quality of it, the price, the trim, and they put a P&L together, and then they come back and say, we think we would do this book, and this is how we would do it. We do a small format or a large format. We need you know, 10 houses. We want to price it at $35 or $45. And then once your deal is done, the book has to be completed. And what people don't realize is they don't create your content for you. They sign you up, as these guys know, and say, all right, come back. In a couple months, show us what you have so far. We'll tell you if you're on the right track. Come back a couple months later and deliver it. And you don't get a lot of direction. So my company, we do a lot of the supervision of what happens during the micro schedule, because it takes a long time. And why does it take a year? Because by the time you deliver a manuscript and pictures, they do copy editing. They revise. They revise the layouts. They get it back to you. Then production, covers, cases, catalog copy, and then everything's printed overseas. So we all know what a challenge that is, because then it has to come back and hope that it's not sitting on, on the water in California like everything else is right now. Um, so what expenses do you have? They're licensing your content. So you, you have to create your content. That is your photographer, stylist, repurchasing any photography that's already been done, paying the writer, sometimes the book design, sometimes somebody to manage the project, and your PR. So it is expensive. And what if you're not ready for a book, and what are the alternatives? Um, there are beautiful brochures and printed materials you can create. I think the best way to do that is responding to your um, people that call. And now Instagram is another opportunity if you want to spend the money where once in a while you can do something that's self-published, it's a brochure, showing exclusively some of our best new work. You know, DM us if you want to see it. And then you can quantify that by having somebody that wants to see it to ask a few questions of, are you interested in building a house? Are you just looking? Um, so, I mean, I still think, you know, a blurb or Apple or, or, or something pretty to hand out Invest in the quality of that, because it's a lot cheaper than doing a big book, and it still gets beautiful things in somebody's hands. Um, like a brand book. There are a lot of people that do those, and I think they've been effective. Why do some books flop? Um, I don't have any pictures here, because I'm not going to show you the floppies. But um, I would say in, in design, I, to, I, I would say the balance of text and pictures. People want a lot of pictures. Um, so sometimes uh, 
it's too text heavy. And it doesn't relate to the, to the author. The other thing is companies. I often see companies that do catalogs. And this is usually in tabletop or product, where a company like a rug company or a, a plate company or whatever, they want to do a book. And I say, it's got to be entertaining and ideas and whatever. And they're like, well, we know how to do this. And then the thing ends up, look, they use a lot of catalog pictures. Those books really don't do well. So I think original photography is important. Um, how do we define our business? My business is I'm a book packager, a producer, and an agent, which means I develop content and coach you on what the content should be and kind of tell you, and most people that approach me, like I said, they're on their way, but they might not have everything. And if they have everything, it's highly unusual for somebody to come to me and they've already shot everything with all the details I need and everything else. Unless we've had this conversation way up front and they say, I really listened and, you know, I got this together and, um, you know, uh, the materials are right and they're really telling a story. Um, and, you know, I think that every, here's another thing, everybody's like, I really want a book, but I want it to be really different. And here's one issue. Photos are shot in a format that fits into magazines. So everybody's format is going to be somewhere around 9 by 11, 8 by 10, 9 and a half by 11, 3 quarters. Like, and vertical books, I, horizontal books, don't really work. So the first thing is you're talking about something in pages with hardcovers in a similar trim size. So really what's going to be different is your graphic designer. And then there are rules, like Amazon wants a dynamic picture. They want something with graphic quality. They want to see your name and a descriptive title. So as much as we want to be different, um, you know, it's really, it's really sometimes more nuancy. And, um, and um, you know, and I think it, it, it all boils down to, in some ways, your cover image and what does it say, how you distinguish yourself. And as you can see, there's a lot of copying. <laughs> And this is not the fault of the authors. This is the fault of the publisher. So I'm going to point something out here that's depressing, but true, where Bobby McAlpin, the cover of his book, has this beautiful, bucolic, inviting house. It was a huge success. So what do you think the publisher wants to do? They want to have Jeffrey Dungan and Ken Persley's book look just like it. And we could fight it tooth and nail, and Amazon will say, oh, another one of those? We'll buy a lot of that. So we fight for individuality, but we live in a world where if it's like something successful, I remember going to the bookseller convention the year, um, uh, what was the huge vampire movie that came out? That, that, yeah, Twilight. I walked through the the Javits, and every single publisher had a vampire book on the lead list. It was like, let's ride that wave now. And so, you know, Amazon and Rizzoli and that, they're no different. It's like, that was a success. What else do you have like it? So is it, here we all fight to be an individual. <laughs> and then you get the powers that be say, can we make it look just like, and in fact, in Bobby's case, his second book, they fought us to have a cover that was just like the first one. And we wanted to do something t totally different. He had this white staircase that was just beautiful. And he was like, this is the statement. We were all pitching it. And Amazon and B&M were like, no, we want something like the other. And we, we were forced to do it. In the contract, the publisher has that decision. We did a cover that looked like the first one, and then it sold like crazy. So <laughs> we're not always right. Anyway, that's kind of it. The book is your centerpiece of your brand marketing. If you're not ready to do a book, I guess my biggest takeaway, invest in quality, photography stuff, do it right, share your work with prospects in the best possible way, because you can't take someone who wants to work with you and walk them through every house you bid. And also, sometimes we know homeowners start adding a bunch of things that dilute what you did after the install. So get it shot at the right time, make it beautiful, and that's how you rip it.
So that's it.